We have arrived in our study of the 7th chapter of Paul's epistle to the Romans at verses 12 and 13. Verses 12 and 13 in the 7th chapter of Paul's epistle to the Romans. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy and just and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid, but sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. Now here, obviously, the apostle is uh, summing up, uh, bringing uh, to a conclusion the argument that he has been developing in the previous verses. In a sense, uh, he has been stating so far uh, what he has found in experience. He is setting out, of course, to deal with the question which is put in verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? That's what he's dealing with. He's got to establish the fact that what he had previously said, especially in verse 5, does not mean that the law is sin. And he has been giving various reasons by which he can prove and demonstrate that uh, he really hasn't been saying that. It might look like that, he says, at first sight. But the moment you really examine the situation, he says it is clear that uh, the trouble is not in the law, but in sin and the use that sin has made even by the law of, or even of the law of God. And he'd ended up by saying that what sin really had done was this. It had taken advantage of the commandment. It had used the commandment as a base of operations, and by means of it had deceived him. And as the result of that, it slew him. It had slain him. Now then, there he has, as it were, stated what he has discovered in his experience. That's the statement of verse 10, in a way. The commandment which was ordained to life was found by me to be, or was found in my case to be, unto death. That was his preliminary summing up, as it were. That is what had happened, you see, because the moment the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. Very well, he says, the commandment which was ordained unto life was found unto me to be death. Then uh, verse uh, 11 uh, explains how he did it by this deceit. So now then he says, there's the case. Let me sum it up for you. Let me bring it to a head as it were. And here it is. Wherefore, in the light of all I've been saying, the law itself is holy and the commandment, holy and just and good. In other words, he's saying, this charge should never be proffered against me, that I am teaching that uh, the law is uh, evil, that the law is sin. Because everything I've been saying is establishing the exact opposite. And here is what he really believes about the law, that it is holy and the commandment, holy and just and good. Now, you notice that he refers to the law and the commandment. There's been a great deal of discussion as to why he does this and what exactly he means. Personally, I find myself in agreement with those who who say that he's just using the variation in order to bring the thing out emphatically. He is really speaking about the whole law. The commandment may well mean the tenth commandment in particular, the commandment which says thou shalt not covet. But it's equally true, of course, of all the other commandments. So he is saying something like this. The law, and indeed every section of it, every part of it, every portion, every individual detailed commandment, the law, general and particular, is, as he says, holy and just and good. Now, the apostle obviously was very concerned to say this and to keep it clear. After all, he was a Jew. After all, he'd been brought up as a Pharisee. 
and had spent the whole of his life, in a sense, in studying the law. Not only that, he's, he has a great burden, as he tells us in chapter 9, in his heart uh, for his uh, fellow countrymen. The last thing he wants to do is to offend them or to have any misunderstanding whatsoever with regard to his view of the law. The law is the law of God. And therefore it is important that he should make perfectly clear as to what he really does think about the law. So we look at his terms. He says, first of all, the law is holy. That means this. To be holy means that it is the absolute antithesis of sin and evil. You see, the charge is that he's saying that the law is sin. He says, far from saying that the law is sin, I'm saying the exact opposite. The eternal opposite of sin is holy, holiness. That is a good way of uh, describing or defining holiness. Holiness means separation. Separation especially from sin and evil. So when he says that the law is holy, he cannot use a stronger term to say that it is as far removed as is conceivable from sin or evil. Or, if you like, you can put it like this. He says the law is holy. Of course it must be. Can't help being. Why? Well, because the, the law is an expression of God's character. That is the function of the law, to give us a revelation of God and his being and his character in order that we may learn what we have to be and to become in order to have communion and fellowship with God. Well, now then, the fundamental statement which the Bible makes about God everywhere is that God is holy. So, you see, the, the commandment, the whole of the law, can be summed up in a sense like this. Be ye holy, because for I am holy. The law is a kind of transcript of the character of God. It is a perfect expression of his desire and of his will. The law, therefore, is holy in the sense that it uh, not only reveals to us the character of God and, the, and what our character should therefore be, but calls us to that. There's his first term. And a very important term it is for us to remember. Then he says in the second place that the law is also just. And here again is something to which we should pay attention. Because, as we've seen in our detailed examination of this section, uh, sin in its deceitfulness is always trying to persuade us that uh, the demands of the law are unjust, that they're unfair, that they're impossible. That we saw last Friday was one of the ways in which the deceitfulness of sin manifests itself. But Paul says, I'm not saying that. I've never said that. The law itself is absolutely just. It is just in what it demands of us. It is right in making that demand of us. It makes no unfair demands of us whatsoever. There is nothing unfair to men in the Ten Commandments. It is all just. It is all right. It is all perfectly fair. So that this uh, specious argument which is brought forward uh, cannot stand examination uh, for a moment. The law of God in all its demands is essentially righteous and absolutely just. Not only that, it is just in another sense. It is perfectly just and justified in the pronouncement and the sentence that it passes upon all sin or transgression of itself or all failure to honor it and to keep it. No man at the final bar of judgment will be able to say that any unjust demand was made of him or that the law is in any way unjust in punishing him. The law has been given. It is perfectly plain and clear. It has told us what will happen if we don't obey. So if we don't obey, we mustn't grumble and complain when the law exacts its penalty. Well, you see that to perfection, of course, with Adam and Eve. They were given the law. They were told exactly what would happen to them if they broke it. 
And then when they did break it and sinned and rebelled against God, they hadn't any right to complain when they were driven out of the garden. They had been told that that would happen. So the law is perfectly just when it exacts its penalty. It's not an excessive penalty. It's not an unjust penalty. It is strictly just and righteous. And that brings us to the third term, which is the term good. It is holy, it is just, it is good. What he means by good is that in all its purposes, in all its objects, and indeed in all its effects, it is something which is good. The law is good for men because, amongst other things, as he's been arguing, it shows us what sin is. It not only does that, it shows us what we ought to be, how we ought to live, how we ought to conduct and comport ourselves. All that is very good for us. Indeed, it is by the law of God, supremely, that a man can learn what is good for him, what is best for him. There is no better life than a life lived in conformity with God's law. Anybody who lived such a life would be living the best conceivable kind or type of life. Our Lord lived such a life. And that is why you will find very often in the Psalms that the psalmist praises the law of God. It's good for him. He says that he knows more than his teachers because of God's law. It is by means of God's law that he has understanding and insight. It is by knowing and learning and attempting to keep God's law that he has had the greatest happiness and the greatest joy in his life. Now, the 119th Psalm is a great psalm, in a sense, just on that one theme, on the goodness of the law of God in and of itself. So the apostle is perfectly justified in saying that the law and each individual commandment is thoroughly good. Nothing can be better for us than the keeping of the law. So the apostle, you see, is saying this. Let nobody ever say again that I'm teaching that the law is sin. My view of the law is, he says, that the law is holy and just and good. It is perfect. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul as you read in Psalm 90. There it is. But still, you see, he hasn't quite finished with his problem. So he goes on in verse 13 to put it. There is a subsidiary problem. Was then that which is good made death unto me? You notice how relentless man is in his opposition to God and his law and his ways. We often meet this, don't we, in handling people's difficulties. You've answered the question apparently fully and satisfactorily. They say, yes, but there's still something. The fertility of the human mind and imagination in creating difficulties is almost endless. It's quite astonishing. But the apostle is patient and is ready to take them up one by one. He says, well, was then that which is good? You've just been saying that the law is holy and just and good. Uh, do you mean to say, therefore, that that which is good uh, was made death unto me? The question, you see, arises in this way. That he has been emphasizing that the law killed him. When the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And again in verse 11, sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me and by it slew me. The laws killed me. Now, the objector then comes up and says, all right, then I'll agree that you've established beyond any doubt at all that the law isn't sin. The law isn't evil. I'll grant you that. But you see, you've just said another thing now which creates a great difficulty in my mind. You say now that the law killed you. Are you saying then that that which is holy and just and good has killed you? How can that which is good kill you? There's the further question. And it is this that the apostle takes up in this 13th verse. Now, I think I said a few weeks ago when I was giving a general analysis of this whole section of this chapter that this 13th verse is a verse which it is a little bit difficult to place. Uh, the question is, does this 13th verse belong to the section we've been looking at from 7 to 12, 
Or does it belong to the section that's following? Is it the introduction to the section that's following? Uh, there's a good deal to be said for both uh, those views of the position of this verse. It doesn't really matter, ultimately, from the standpoint of truth, but if you like to have an orderly mind, you can't help being interested in a thing like this. Now, the thing that uh, would incline me a little to say that it belongs to the next section is the form in which he puts it. You see, he began at verse 7, a section by saying, what shall we say then? Now, that's his normal way of introducing a new section. Then he puts his question, is the law sin? Answers, God forbid. We've seen him doing that. He did it at the beginning of chapter 6. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. He did it at verse 15 in chapter 6. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? God forbid. Question, God forbid. Well, now, he's doing that here again. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. So that in many senses, it does seem to be introducing a new section. And yet, it clearly is also a continuation of what he's just been saying. It is this particular point of uh, this good law slaying him and being death to him, being made death to him. And he's dealing with that. So that uh, I think perhaps the best way of dealing with it is to describe it like this. It is one of these transition verses that belongs partly to both. Uh, when I come to the next section, uh, I shall try to show that the whole of the next section, in a sense, is but an elaboration and an expansion of the theme of the section which we are now finishing. So that this may very well be this sort of transition a verse with a hook onto the previous one and a hook onto the one that is coming. And perhaps that is the best way of looking at it. Now then, here, however, is the question. Granted that the law is just, is holy and just and good, nevertheless, it does seem to be something that has caused this spiritual death about which he has been saying so much. Therefore, the question is, is then the law the cause of this death? And the answer comes immediately, God forbid, let it not even be mentioned. It is unthinkable. Well, what is it then? What has he been saying? Well, now, he gives the answer in a most extraordinary statement. And it's extraordinary and difficult for one reason only, that the apostle left out the verb you see, he does that sort of thing. The apostle was not a pedant, thank God. Uh, he uh, often uh, breaks the rules of grammar. And here he's actually left out the verb, which we clearly must uh, supply in order to get at his meaning. The meaning is perfectly plain, uh, but you can stumble if you're uh, pedantic uh, because he hasn't actually uh, put in the verb. He was making a statement and then should have put in his verb and didn't. Now then, what he is saying, therefore, is this. It isn't the law that uh, killed me, but sin. God forbid that anybody should say that I'm teaching that the law was made death unto me. It wasn't. It was sin that did it. That's the verb. It was sin that did it. It wasn't the law that killed me. It was sin that killed me. So that you can translate like this, if you like. But sin was the cause or sin became death unto me. Or if you like, you can even put it like this. Sin was allowed to produce and to lead to this result of death in me. That is patently the meaning of the statement. And it cannot carry any other meaning. What he's saying is this, you see. That God in his infinite wisdom allowed sin to do this with the law in order that certain results might follow. That's what this statement is really saying. We have seen that he's put it twice already that uh, sin taking occasion by, uh, making use of, setting out from there as a military base of operations, as a fulcrum and so on. Very well. Well, now then he says... God allowed sin to do that with the law. It's a, it's a great problem, of course. 
Why did the holy God allow sin to do this with his law which is holy and just and good? Well now then, says the apostle, here is the answer. This was allowed in order that sin might appear sin. Which means that sin might be shown up for what it really is. That's the difficulty with sin, is to recognize it for what it is. Sin is deceitful. Sin is very clever. Sin is like the fisherman that hides itself and conceals the bait. Sin is going to be shown up, that it might appear, that it might be shown to be sin, to be shown up as sin. That's, that's what he said. And therefore he says this, that it is the law that really does that. Sin uh, was not quite as clever as it thought it was. Uh, that is uh, the thing that comes out in the Bible everywhere about the devil. The devil is very clever and he's very subtle, but not quite as clever as he thinks he is. You see, when the, the devil brought about through men the death and the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ, he thought he was bringing out his final masterpiece, but it was the thing that finished him. Now then, the same thing is true of sin. Sin thought that it cleverly was going to use the law, and it did in the senses that we've seen experimentally. Yes, but while it was doing it, it was exposing itself. That's what he's saying here. It is the law that really helps us to see sin for what it is, as really sin. And, of course, this comes out as he's already been explaining to us in this way, that this law of God which is holy and just and good, that that, because of sin and its evil use of the law, is something that kills us. It isn't the law that kills us. It is sin that kills us by using the law in this particular way. Very well, then, there is, he, sir, there is what he tells us is the first reason why this was ever allowed to take place. It is in this way that sin as sin becomes clear and evident to us. Well, he's already put that experimentally earlier on. You remember when he says, I have not known lust, except the Lord said, thou shalt not covet. And it was only when sin revived, when the law came, that he was killed and realized the truth about himself and the truth about sin. Therefore, that's the first thing. But he says there is a second object, and it's this. That sin, by means of the commandment, or through the commandment, might become exceeding sinful. Here is an important statement. It is only by the law that the exceeding sinful character of sin is demonstrated and is brought out. In other words, the apostle is concerned to show not only the power of sin, but the malignity of sin. This is the thing, you see, that people are so slow to learn. This is the thing that uh, all of us by nature know nothing at all about. People today, they're always crying out about this biblical doctrine of sin. They hate it. And some clever, popular preachers, they're always ridiculing sin in terms of psychology. That's just the measure of their extreme utter blindness. There is nothing that is so true of sin as its exceeding sinfulness. And where do you see the exceeding sinfulness of sin so much as just here? That it can even handle and use this holy, just, good law of God and by means of it kill us. It can twist it, it can pervert it, it can turn it into an instrument that is opposed to us. God's holy law, which is for our good, was then that which is good made death unto me? No, no, it wasn't itself, but sin in its handling and abuse of it and its perverting of it and its using it deceitfully has brought that to pass. It isn't the law that's done it, it's sin that's done it. And by seeing that sin has done that, we see its devilish character, its utter malignity, its foulness. 
There is nothing which is too strong that can be said about it. Here it is in the expression, exceeding sinful. There's nothing worse than that. Sin in its essence. Sin in all its horrible, foul nature. There it is. Well, now then. That is the uh, exact uh, meaning of the statement which the Apostle makes. Now, this is clearly a very important statement for us all to grasp. Uh, Not only because it uh, shows us the exceeding sinful character and nature of sin, but because it at the same time does something else, and that is to instruct us with regard to the whole function and purpose of God's law and the giving of the law. Now then, that is, you see, after all, the fundamental theme which the Apostle is handling. Let me put something in brackets. The secret of expounding Romans 7 is to avoid and evade becoming lost in the details. There is no chapter in the whole Bible, I think, in which it is so easy to miss the wood because of the trees as this seventh chapter of the epistle to the Romans. So it is my duty to go on reminding you as to what the fundamental object is, what it is all about. Otherwise we'll be lost in the details. Now then, the fundamental object, the fundamental theme is this. What is the place and the function of the law in God's dealings with the human race? That's the question. And every detail must be considered in the light of that and of nothing else. To start thinking that the object of Romans 7 is that Paul should give us his experience is to miss the whole point. That isn't what he's setting out to do at all. The fundamental object is to deal with this. That Jews and others were turning to the apostle. If they didn't do it directly to him, they were saying it behind their back. They were saying, this man's preaching means this, that the law of God is not only no good, that it's even evil, that it had no function or purpose at all, it would have been better if it had never been given. That's what was the charge brought against him, that his preaching of justification by faith only and by grace, salvation by grace, was really throwing the law right out, dismissing it entirely. Now then, here, this is a very crucial verse. He shows us what the real function and purpose of the law is. And what is it? Well, here it is. We can't improve on this. It is to show the exceeding sinfulness of sin. That's the function of the law. Of course, the apostle has really said it before. Not in these exact terms, but he's made the same general point in chapter 3, verse 20. Summing up a great argument about justification, he says, Therefore, By the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. It is the law that gives us an understanding of sin. That's its function, that's its purpose. It was never meant to justify. By the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. It wasn't meant to do more than that. And here, you see, he is repeating that, but saying something further. Now, again, let us see a parallel statement in that uh, section we read from the epistle to the Galatians in chapter 3 and verse 19 in particular. Wherefore then serveth the law? He puts up his question. He answers, It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. Now, it all means this. The law was never meant nor intended to be a way of salvation. The fundamental error of the Jews was to think that it was. That was exactly why they'd gone wrong and had gone astray. He says it again in chapter 9. Israel, he says, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at the stumbling stone. That was their whole trouble. 
they would persist in thinking that God had given his law in order that people might save themselves through the law. Here he is saying once more, it was never given for that reason. Salvation is a matter of grace entirely. God had stated that right away back in the Garden of Eden, but very specifically in the covenant that he made with Abraham. Now, says Paul in Galatians 3, the thing that governs salvation is the covenant that God made with Abram and his seed. And he proves, you remember, that he was looking forward to Christ. Now, says Paul, the law, which only came in 430 years after the covenant with Abram, cannot disannul or affect that fundamental original covenant. It can't do that. It was never meant to do it. Well, then, why was it brought in at all? Ah, says Paul, it was brought in afterwards in order that people might see their need of the covenant of grace. It was brought in because of transgressions till the seed shall come to whom the promise was made. And so he later puts it that it was a kind of schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. It doesn't save. It brings us to the Savior. It isn't a way of salvation. No, it is to show us our need of the salvation and to give us some indication of how it's going to come. Now then, that is the most important point. Nothing is more important than to understand this. That's what the apostle is setting out to do in this seventh chapter. He says, get rid once and forever of this notion that the law in any way or shape or form was meant to save us. The law cannot justify us. The law cannot sanctify us. And if you try to either justify or sanctify yourself by means of the deeds of the law, you are doing something which is impossible. Here, the particular emphasis is upon the utter impossibility of ever being sanctified by the law. Sin being what it is, in all its power and malignity and subtlety and its exceeding sinfulness, and our being weak as we are because of the fall and sin which is within us, the thing is an utter impossibility. And we must get rid of it once and forever. It is essential, says the apostle, that you must be absolutely clear about this. So he has been working out this argument from verse 7 to the end of this verse 13. But you know he is so anxious that we should be clear about it that he doesn't even stop at verse 13. As I was saying a moment ago, at verse 14 and there on to the end of the chapter, he proceeds still further to prove just that one thing. He'll do it there in, by a form of psychological and spiritual analysis. But it's the same point exactly. Verses 14 to the end are an elaboration of just this one thing, that a man can never become sanctified by the deeds of the law or by any attempt to work out himself the commandments and the dictates of the law. Now then, here, you see, we've arrived at a point of transition. But before I ask you to begin to look with me at verse 14, I must detain you with one other question. It's got to be faced because the apostle, in a sense, makes us face it. It is this. Of whom has the apostle been speaking in the previous verses? Let's get this clear. I am not going to discuss now the identity of the person about whom Paul is speaking from verse 14 to the end. I am discussing the identity of the person he's been speaking about from verse 7 to verse 13. Nay, he says in verse 7, I had not known sin but by the law. I had not known lust except the law said. I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. The commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death, and the, it, it slew me, and so on. Now then, the question is, uh, of whom is the apostle speaking? There have been those who have said that the apostle 
is not speaking of himself at all though, but that he has been personifying in his own person the state and the condition of the Jews. He, they say that when he says, I was alive without the law once, he is describing the condition of the Jews before the law was given by God through Moses to them. The commandment came when God gave the Ten Commandments and the moral law. Well, we needn't stay with that. There are very few, if any today, who would still go on believing that. If the apostle meant that, why didn't he say so? It would have been so much easier to say so. No, he is clearly and patently talking about himself and his own experience because he's putting it in terms of concupiscence. It's personal experience, something that happens to an individual. So I think we can dismiss that. But here now then rises the question, what stage of his life, what stage in his human experience is the apostle describing? Here again there are some who say that what the apostle is saying is this, I was alive without the law once. From my birth until about the age of 12, of course, I knew nothing about these things at all. But then, at the age of 12, like every other Jewish boy, I began to be instructed about the law. And the moment I was given the teaching about the law, I began to understand about sin, and I saw that I was a sinner. So they say that the first statement is about Paul until he became an adolescent, and that then he is describing his experience as an adolescent. But I would reject this again out of heaven, and for this good reason that the bit of autobiography that the Apostle gives us in Philippians 3, it seems to me, excludes it completely. Here he says in verse 6, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Not when he was a boy, not when he was an infant, not until he became an adolescent, no, no, but right up until he became a Christian. He was a typical Pharisee. And like uh, all Pharisees, he was very pleased with himself. We've already interpreted verse 9. I was alive without the law once. I thought I was doing well. I was convinced I was keeping the law. It was because he hadn't understood about coveting. He reduced it to a number of actions and particular things. And therefore he thought that all was well. That was his condition as a Pharisee. Not many until the age of 12. So we reject that interpretation. Then uh, there are those who would have us believe that he is referring here to his experience after his conversion. They say no man can know what the law really is until he is regenerate, until he is converted. Paul says the commandment came, sin revived, I died. Yes, it came at conversion or subsequent to it. And he began to understand the law and then went through that experience. But again, I would personally reject that for this reason. That the Apostle Shirley in this section is describing the condition of a man who is under the law. Here is a man who is a victim of the law. He is under the law. Everything that he says describes a man in that condition. But I've got a more powerful argument. This section that we've been looking at, verses 7 to 13, is really an elaboration of verse 5, which reads like this. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. That's the primary statement, and all we've been looking at is an elaboration of that. Fruit unto death, slew me. Yes, he's a man under the law, and the law is taking advantage uh, the, the sin is taking advantage of the law in order to kill him. He is describing a man who is in the flesh. And a man who is in the flesh is not a Christian, because he describes the Christian like this in chapter 8 in verse 9. But you, he says, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of him. So here we've got a man who's in the flesh, and if he's in the flesh, he's not in the spirit, and if he's not in the spirit, he is not a Christian. 
So what he's talking about here is not something that has happened subsequent to conversion. We reject that also. Very well, we are left with this. It must have been before his conversion. Well, then the question arises, when was this before his conversion? Because he still does this. He is in the flesh still, and all the effects that he describes are those which happen in a man in the flesh. But he also tells us that he has now got a spiritual understanding of the law. The commandment has really come to him with power. He sees its spiritual character. He's understood the meaning of thou shalt not covet. Now then, we've got to put these things together. What does it amount to? Well, it seems to me there is only one adequate solution. It is this. Here is a man who is under conviction of sin, but has not yet understood the truth about salvation in Christ Jesus. He's deeply convicted of sin. He's been slain. He's dead. He realizes not only that he's guilty, but that he's helpless, and that he's got sin within him. But he doesn't realize any more than that. Now then, the apostle you noticed here is describing something that was once true of him. He is looking back. I had not known sin but by the law. I had not known lust except the law said thou shalt not covet. Sin taking occasion by the commandment, it wrought in me. He isn't saying he's still doing it. It did it then. It is all in the past. I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. He isn't still dying. It happened. He's looking back. It is all in the past. Everybody's agreed about that. He is looking back across a past experience. When did this happen? The apostle doesn't tell us. Are you sorry he didn't tell you? You shouldn't be. If it had been important that he should have told us when exactly this happened, he would have done so. As I go on reminding you, the apostle is not primarily concerned here about his own experience or about himself. He's merely illustrating this tremendous point of his. He's showing us the position of this man, now awakened to the truth about the law. And there he leaves him. He doesn't tell us any more about it. When was this? Well, what I'm going to say now is, in a sense, speculation. I'm only putting ideas before you. Nobody can prove this. There are different views. Nobody can establish any one of them. We can't be certain. The apostle has not chosen to tell us. And because he hasn't chosen to tell us, we can't be certain of the position. But let me put some ideas before you for your consideration. Did this happen to him before his experience on the road to Damascus? What is exactly the meaning of that phrase? You remember in Acts 9, in verse 5, when our Lord, speaking to Saul of Tarsus there on the road to Damascus, said this, It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks, to struggle against the girl. Of course, the answer is still that we don't know. We don't know. But it is not impossible that this man, Saul of Tarsus, was already convicted of sin. Ah, but you say, if that was so, why did he go down breathing threatenings and slaughter against the Lord Jesus Christ and all his followers? Men convicted of sin only have often done that. In their misery, their unhappiness, and his righteousness and self-righteousness as a Pharisee would still be making him hate this teacher of everybody. It's not incompatible at all. Interesting point here from the experimental and practical standpoint. Take it as a word of encouragement. If you're concerned about some dear one whom you'd like to see as a Christian and whom you're praying for, sometimes, just before they're going to be converted, they become most violent against it. It is an indication that there's something going on. The violence is often a very good sign. Was it that the apostle was convicted of sin 
before he went on the journey to Damascus? I can't exclude it. I'm not saying that I believe it was actually that. I can't exclude it. Another possibility. Is he describing here what happened to him between the event on the road to Damascus and the coming of Ananias to him with the comfort of the gospel and the baptism of the Holy Spirit? You notice that we are told some very interesting things here. Let me indicate the ones which I regard as most important. In verse 6 I read, And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord. Trembling and astonished. Indeed, let's have the whole verse. He, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. In other words, our Lord didn't really of necessity give him the full comfort of salvation there if he gave it him at all. Here is Paul suddenly made to tremble and astonish. It was the sight, of course, of this Lord that was speaking to him. It was the realization that it was Jesus. At any rate, he came to realize this, that he'd made a most terrible blunder about this person, and he knew now that he was God, trembling and astonished. And all he's told is this, you go there to Damascus, go into the city, it shall be told there what you must do. But then there is another statement in verse 9 that interests me. He was there three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. That's not a man rejoicing in salvation. Trembling and astonished, amazed, blinded, physically, didn't eat and drink for three days. And then, you see, we get in verse 19, and when he had received meat, he was strengthened. He had become very weak. Well, now a three-day fast doesn't make anybody as weak as that. But I can understand a terrible conviction of sin doing that. Here was a man, you see, who was expert in the law. And suddenly this light from heaven comes down upon him, showing that he'd been all wrong. And I suggest to you that in those three days, he suddenly saw how completely wrong he'd been about the law. He saw its spiritual character. He understood the meaning of coveting. And hell was let loose within him. And he saw his complete death his complete failure and utter inability. But the coming of Ananias was clearly and obviously a great help to him. Brother Saul, he said, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way, as thou camest, hath sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And he was. He not only regains his sight, but he wants to eat and is able to eat and is strengthened. For myself, I am content to believe that that period is sufficient to account for all we've been looking at in verses 7 to 13 of this seventh chapter of the epistle. There is only one other possibility which I myself would exclude, and that is that something of this went on during the three years that he was in Arabia. I cannot accept that, because... Here, I believe, he received, was baptized with the Holy Ghost. And I cannot conceive that such a man should be going through the experience that he describes in the verses that we have been considering. To me, therefore, it seems most probable that it is the period between the Damascus Road experience and the coming of Ananias. But I wouldn't exclude that something had been happening even prior to that. Well, as I say, that is not the main issue. That is not the main point. It isn't the apostle's fundamental concern. All he is saying is this, that there was a time in his life when he was alive, self-satisfied, self-righteous, self-confident, but that when he did understand the spiritual character and nature and meaning of the law, it Killed him. It knocked the life out of him. He became as a dead man, completely hopeless, utterly, and absolutely helpless. That's the thing he wants us to understand. When it happened, really doesn't matter. But that that happened, 
is of extreme significance, as he will now proceed to show us further when he proceeds from the beginning of verse 14 and goes on to the end of verse 25. Let us pray. O Lord our God, we again come into thy presence and thank thee that we are in thy hands and that we are thy workmanship. We thank thee that our salvation does not depend even upon our understanding, but is thy work. And yet we do thank thee again as we did at the beginning for the understanding that thou dost give us through thy Spirit. O Lord, receive our humble prayers. We thank thee that thou hast opened our eyes. Deliver us from that blindness in which we were, from that thraldom to sin and all its evil use of the law. We thank thee that we are dead to sin, dead to the law by the body of Christ, that we are in the Spirit and not in the flesh. We bless thy name for newness of life, and that we now are able to obey thy commandments, not in the oldness of the letter, but in the newness of the Spirit. O God, receive our prayers. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship and the communion of the Holy Spirit abide and continue with us, now, this night, throughout the remainder of this our short, uncertain earthly life and pilgrimage, and evermore. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust Audio Library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.